Good morning and welcome to Gower Springs First Baptist Church. My name is Tim Deal. I am senior adult and pastoral care pastor here at the church. Before we get started this morning, we have a few announcements to share with you. First, join us next Sunday, November 27th, for combined worship service in the Worship Center at 9.30 a.m. We will continue our study of Abraham, so you won't want to miss it. Ladies, invite your friends, moms, aunts, sisters, and daughters to our annual Joy Brunch. This will be a time of great food, fellowship, and fun. We will eat, listen to a short testimony, and worship together as we enter into the Christmas season. You might even win a door prize. The cost is $10 per adult and $5 for those 12 and under. You will not want to miss this fun time, so register at gsfbc.org forward slash women today. As we prepare to enter the busy Christmas season, our prayer is that we will all keep the true meaning of Christmas in the forefront of our minds. Beginning next Sunday, the start of Advent, we will have worshipful moments together during our Sunday morning worship services to create a season of expectation and spiritual preparation, culminating with the celebration of Jesus' birth. We have also prepared a special devotional guide written by staff and church members that you can use throughout the week to prepare your heart for Christmas. Guides will be available in the main lobby and venue lobby beginning today, and we will start reading together next Monday, November 28th. We encourage you to pick one up and participate. Uh, once again, thank you for being here with us today. And now let's join together for a time of worship and praise.
mighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Corinthians 12 verses 9 and 10 say this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with my weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong.
know you Jesus there's no one beside you forever the hope in my heart Amen thank you guys so much for singing you can go ahead and have a seat this morning great time of worship already. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm Pastor Jason. I'm excited uh, to worship with you this morning. I want to offer a very warm welcome. As you walked in, you received a worship guide. It looks something like this. We invite you to take a look at all the things that are happening here at Geyer Springs over the next several weeks, but especially we want you, if you're a guest today, to take a look at that tab on the far right side. You can do a couple things with it. You can rip it off and fill it out for us at the end of the service. If you'll drop that in the basket on the doors, that'd be great. If you'd rather do that online, you can use the QR code and fill that out on your phone or tablet. And we would love to be able to know how to serve you and minister to you in the days ahead. Well, I wanna say uh, namaste. We just got back from India last night. If you smell curry in the room, it's coming out of my pores. Um, we had a team of nine go to India and uh, we spent the last 10 days there. So thank you for praying uh, for us and with us. Uh, 1.3 billion people live on the subcontinent of India and uh, it's an exciting time to be able to go partner with Indian national pastors who are serving the gospel. Less than 2% of the entire continent um, are evangelical Christians. So the need is huge, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers that we sent away from our church there did an incredible job. We saw 220 salvations. We were able to serve uh, and reach 2,500 people through compassion kit parties. And through your faithful giving, we were able to give over 1,100 compassion kits, which is what drew those people to hear the gospel and at that gospel uh, presentations where they receive Christ. And so thank you so much for participating in the gospel by praying, by giving, and by sending us. It is a joy to come back and be able to, to offer a really cool report as we served uh, there in West Bengal. Um, we want to uh, pray for our Indian brothers and sisters, pray for these who've followed Christ. Um, we want to draw them into baptism, which is uh, it's really a pretty ginormous step for uh, the Indian nationals to move into that public profession of faith, because that will mean for many of them, they will lose family members, they will be ostracized and often uh, persecuted in their villages. And so that's a big step. Um, so we're praying for them. Thank you for praying for us. It's good to be back. Don't call me this afternoon, I will be sleeping. Um, we have an exciting time here at our church. This last summer, our age group staff decided uh, the best way moving forward in our ministry was to kind of adjust our kids' ministry to move that into a, a first through fifth grade and then pull sixth grade up into our student ministry. That meant for us, we wanted to begin to launch out a new middle school ministry strategy. And for us to be able to do that, we needed to find and search for a middle school pastor to come alongside uh, our lead student pastor, Casey Winstead. And so in that endeavor, we've been praying and thinking and asking the Lord to provide uh, someone to come do that. And we believe God has given us someone very unique and very gifted to that. So I'm gonna invite Richard and Haley Barkheimer to join me on stage last week in the worship guide. You saw some information about Haley and Richard. It's inside the worship guide this morning. They're currently serving families and kids and education at Zion Hill Baptist Church in Cabot, Arkansas. And so they're here this morning in view of a call seeking God as to what, uh, what may be for them next. And so for here, he's our candidate as our middle school pastor. And so I've asked Richard just to spend a few minutes sharing a little bit of your story, your testimony with us. And then after he's done, we'll continue through uh, our process. Richard, share with us a little bit. Well, good morning, everybody. Like you said, my name is Richard Barkheimer and this is my wife, Haley. We're actually next, oh, not next Sunday, two Sundays from today, celebrating one year of marriage, and so we're looking forward to that. And that would also, if we were to go to a view of a call for the yes vote, be our first Sunday here. So we're excited, looking forward to that. Just to share a little bit about myself, I grew up in Camden, Arkansas, and I've known the Lord as long as I can remember. I remember being about four years old when I first professed Christ, I was going to sing a song at my grandmother's church, I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me, still one of my favorite gospel songs. It brings me a little bit of emotion just thinking back to the time where I sang that song and my mom asked me if, well, I, if, she, if I asked my mom, I asked my mom if she wanted me to be a singer, and she said, well, if that's what you want to do, and I asked her, well, what about do you want me to be a preacher, and she said, well, if that's what you want to do, and I asked her another question, and she looked at me and said, 
it doesn't matter to me what you do as long as you have Jesus in your heart. And I looked at her, tapped my chest, told her, I already have Jesus in my heart. But the story doesn't end there. I remember believing in Jesus, knowing who God is since I was four years old. I'm 26 now, so 22 years of my life. But through those 22 years, I've seen God work. I've seen God be my, my shelter, my rock, my refuge. As I was about maybe seven years old when my mother and my father divorced. And as a young kid, I, I didn't understand that. You know, my mother and father were there and then they were split. And through that time, I just relied on God. You know, he knew what was happening. And once I got older and I understood, it was for the better. And my mother remarried to a man who was an alcoholic and he was abusive. And I could remember praying to God for shelter, for refuge, for help just seeking him he's always been that even when during also during this time my father was shipped to Iraq to fight in the war and so my father was gone my mother was married to this man and God filled that role he was that father figure he was that rock he was that shelter he was that being that I could rely on he was God to me and when I grew up in Calvary Baptist Church in Camden I went through Awanas and got to youth group in seventh grade by this point my mom had divorced my former stepdad and she had married my current stepdad who I will refer to always as my dad he's raised me since I was nine years old and we started going to another church and I wasn't too keen on the idea of leaving all my friends and leaving my home church and we went to First Baptist Church in Camden and it's definitely a God thing as when we went to First Baptist my faith grew so much as I entered youth group and built bonds with my youth pastor and my first youth pastor, my second youth pastor, who I would, his name is Josh Steed, he took time and invested in me. He saw something, something in me that I didn't realize. And when I was 16 years old, I remember having a conversation with him, telling him, Josh, I don't really understand what I'm supposed to be doing. I just feel like I'm supposed to be doing something, but I don't know what that something is. And he kind of started understanding what I was trying to ask him, and he started praying with me, started leading me, and that's when I felt the call to ministry when I was 16 years old. We went through a book called Am I Called by Jeff Iorg, and through that book came to realization that God was indeed calling me into ministry. And so from that point on, Josh helped me fulfill those roles by doing student ministry, helping in children's ministry, trying to figure out what specifically was I called, and I really felt the passion and the calling to youth ministry. And so he let me lead some Bible studies in our youth group, let me teach a couple Wednesdays, and if I was a video of them, they were probably awful, but it was the Lord's word was, word was spoken. And I went, I graduated high school in 2015, I went to Washita Baptist my freshman year, I was gonna be a Christian studies major, and after, I guess, my first semester, I started to feel that, that tug again, God calling me, and it was very confusing because I felt like I was where I needed to be, but God had other plans. He knew my passion for sports, and I transferred out of Washita. I went to Southern Arkansas University in 2016, and I ran track for three years. And I was very confused because Southern Arkansas University isn't a Christian school. It doesn't even offer a Christian studies major. You can as a minor, and so I was very confused. And so I graduated from SAU with a finance degree, but while I was in college, I had multiple opportunities to lead youth group at churches just like First Baptist Camden not long after I graduated our youth my, my youth pastor just left and I filled in for a little bit and then I did an interim over the summer a volunteer internship I'm pretty sure I did all three there and kind of got some experience and my junior and senior year at SAU, I got involved in a college group and I helped co-lead that college group. And when, after I graduated college, I got involved in another youth ministry in First Baptist Church Smackover where I served as kind of their interim youth pastor for a time period. And that was in 2020, no, 20, the end of 2019 and then the summer of 2020. And then in August of, well, October of 2020, I took on my current position at Zion Hill Baptist Church where I serve as the Children's Youth and Education Director. and 
Haley and I, we, like I said, we were married last December and we'll be celebrating a year, but she has been such a blessing to ministry. As she, as many of you know, when you're married, that person is your partner, that person is your support, and she definitely could not, I definitely could not do God's work without her in my life, and so she is definitely a blessing. I'm very excited about student ministry because I know the impact my youth pastor had on me, and I want to share that impact that he had on me with others and build those bonds, build those connections, build those relationships, because it wasn't because he wanted to get the glory of my youth pastor. It wasn't like, well, I'm going to take this young man under my wing, teach him, and for my personal gain, it was for God's kingdom. And through him, him reaching out to me, him doing the Lord's work, I have that same opportunity to do the Lord's work and reach other students so that they can go and do the Lord's work just as we're called to do. And I'm very excited and thrilled to be here. And it's an honor and a blessing to have this calling in my life and to serve here or wherever else. And so thank you. Thank you so much, Richard, for sharing. What we want to do is we want to pray right now for Richard and for Haley. And, uh, and then we're going to take a vote here this morning. They'll go downstairs to the worship center and do the same. So let's pray together. Father, we're asking for favor and understanding and wisdom as you've led Richard and Haley to participate with us. God, we're so excited about what this journey may mean for them, certainly what it means for you and your church. God, would you lead us and would you guide us? Thank you so much for what you've done thus far. Father, may we glorify you in all that we say and do in these moments. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm gonna ask you guys to go ahead and step out and Casey's gonna lead you guys downstairs. As they do so, we want you to be aware that uh, Richard and Haley have met with our directional team and pastor. They've also met with our personnel team. And so it comes recommended from our personnel team and our directional team that Haley and Richard come this morning in view of a call. And so what we wanna do in this moment is take a vote. Uh, what I'm gonna ask you guys to do, voice vote, all in favor of calling Richard Barkheimer to be our middle school pastor, respond by saying yes. Are there any no's? Great, so we're gonna move forward with that downstairs in the worship center. We're so excited again about what God is doing and how God is leading here at our church and our student ministry. We're grateful for that time. I'm gonna ask you guys to stand. While we do that, uh, we're gonna continue our worship time. Let us pray and ask the Lord to continue to lead us. Father, as we worship you, as we sing to you, may our hearts be overjoyed by the grace that you've given us and the mercy that you provide us. May we worship you with our hearts and minds this morning. For God, you are worthy to be praised. And in Christ's name, we pray these things. Amen.
There's no greater song we could sing than to give you glory, to declare you holy. Lord, we are so grateful for this uh, opportunity to worship together this morning. Lord, teach us, Lord, to see you um, have a bigger picture of who you are, God. Lord, show us more of yourself today as we open your scriptures. Lord, may we be challenged to increase our dependency on you, to trust you, to know that you are good and faithful. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. Last week in Genesis 21, Abraham Abraham and Sarah experienced the incredible blessing of seeing God's perfect plan fulfilled by the birth of Isaac, the child of promise. It waited 25 years for Isaac. Isaac was the one through whom God would multiply Abraham's descendants. He would build a great nation. Through that nation, he would bless all nations and all peoples. Abraham was chosen to be the father of faith simply by the grace of God. He was going to be the patriarch of a great nation, not because he had done anything to deserve that, but simply because God bestowed his favor and grace on him, and that grace was simply offered because of the kindness of God. And then the birth of Isaac as well. Isaac was born out of the kindness and grace of God, and the birth of Isaac is a picture of our own salvation. We are born into the kingdom of God. We are saved solely by God's grace, by his kindness. It's as Paul said in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And throughout Abraham and Sarah's lives, throughout this journey that we've been on, especially in chapter 21 and today in chapter 22, we're seeing the sovereignty of God at work. God has a plan and God has the power and God has the will to bring that plan to pass. He is sovereign. And the same thing we see in their lives of God's sovereign plan at work in them can be true for us as well if we're surrendered to his sovereignty. But surrender is hard. We want to live life the way we want to live life. We don't want a, a sovereign over us, ruling over us, telling us how to live. But what we fail to recognize is that self rule, which is what we're all trying to attain, self rule means we're under sin's rule. We're going to have a master, and we're not going to be our own master. Either Christ rules or sin rules. If, if Jesus is not Lord, then sin will be Lord. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, you've probably met people like I have that are living a life of sin, and they enjoy it, and they would tell you there is great pleasure in it, but those who are slaves to sin will one day discover the truth. In Hebrews 11, verse 25, the pleasures of sin last only for a season or only for a short time. There's a better master. There's a better outcome. Paul expressed that in Romans chapter 6 and verse 22, by now, but now you've been set free from sin, you've become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and in its end, eternal life. That's why we want to be under the sovereignty of God. That's why we want to surrender and sacrifice anything that would prevent that in our lives. Well, we're in Genesis 22 this morning. In Genesis 22, we're going to continue to observe the sovereignty of God unfolding in the life of Abraham and Sarah. Let's read together in Genesis 22, verses 1 through 19. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. 
And then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them together. Verse 7, Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamp for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Well, Genesis 22 is about, about letting go, about surrendering. It's about releasing anything that would come before our relationship with God. You know, a big part of our uh, fallen nature is the desire to possess or the desire to control we, because of our fallen nature, we, we gather treasures and we keep them close. And the more valuable they are, the more tightly we hold on and the harder it is to, to let go or to release those things. A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Pursuit of God, wrote about our desire to possess and control. This is what he said. There is within the human heart a tough, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature it is to possess, always to possess, the pronouns my and mine express the real nature of the old Adamic man. My and mine are verbal symbols of our deep disease. The roots of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one root unless we die. I'm going to bet if you're a parent in this room, I'm willing to bet that when you were teaching your children how to speak and helping them learn vocabulary words, you never had to explain or practice the words my and mine. That probably never happened, did it? No, one night they were sleeping, and as they were sleeping, some little uh, demonic being fluttered into the room and whispered those words into their little innocent ears, and when they awakened the next morning, their innocence and your sanity had fluttered away. Right? How many times did you have to break up a fight among your children, a fight that started with the word, mine? You know, even as adults, even as committed believers who know what the Word of God says about ownership and stewardship, we still struggle with my and mine, don't we? It's possessiveness. It comes from our old, our fallen nature. Jesus said our heart would follow our treasures. So what is it you treasure? I thought this week about the different types of treasures we have. For some of us, our greatest treasures are possessions, our our home, our, our cars, our, our boat. Maybe your treasure is your, your clothing or your jewelry or it's a vacation home or, a, or property. It's something material that we possess or a variety of physical things that we hold too tightly. For others, your highest treasure is your vocation or your career. Your entire identity is, is wrapped up in what you do and what you can achieve. And so if that's your treasure, when your job is in jeopardy, it results in panic or anxiety. If your vocation, your career is threatened, you might become depressed or, or lose any reason for living. 
Is that your treasure? Another treasure we hold tightly to that's related to that is our dreams. Dreams aren't necessarily a bad thing. Dreams can motivate us. They can sustain us through difficult times. They can push us to greater heights. But what if your dreams are not what God intended? What if your dreams are going to take you down a path that God didn't intend for you to go down? For many of us, our valuable treasures, relationships. We treasure and hold tightly to a parent or a child or a, a spouse or a friend. You can clearly see from what we just read in Genesis 22, as God is calling Abraham to sacrifice this morning, we find that his highest treasure was a relationship. And, and wrapped up in that relationship was his dream and his, his hope for the future and his purpose in living, all wrapped up in, in Isaac. His treasure was the long-awaited son, the, the child of promise. He would give anything and make any sacrifice for Isaac. His treasure was so valuable that he cherished it to the point that it threatened to supersede his relationship with God. Now, Abraham is no stranger to sacrifice. You recall from where we started, he had left his home country. He had left his people. He'd become a nomad. He had, he had wandered all these years. He's been a wanderer, and he's endured many trials. He left a very comfortable life to follow God, and his journey had matured him in faith. And that's how we've come to this point. The time has come for that faith to be put to the supreme test. Verse 1 says, very simply, God tested Abraham. Just think back to last week for just a minute. Remember the incredible despair and, and distress that it brought on Abraham to have to send his son Ishmael away. And we don't know how long the time span between 20, chapter 21 and chapter 22, but evidently Abraham had had a time of, of some years of peace and tranquility, tranquility. He was able to enjoy his time with Isaac and, and invest his life in Isaac and watch Isaac grow and mature. And during that same time, his relationship with God has grown stronger. Abraham has matured in his faith. You remember at the end of chapter 21 last week in verse 33, Abraham gave God or called the name of God the eternal God. He came to know God as the eternal God. What does that mean? He's a God he could count on, the God who would do just as he promised because he never changes. Eternal God is, is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows what is best. He knows what is best for us. He knows the future for each one of us. He knows what we'll face, and he knows how to prepare us. And so now this eternal God has made the decision to put Abraham's faith to the test. You know, if it isn't tested, it isn't faith. How do you know you have faith unless there is a test, unless there's difficulty, unless there's a challenge that, that comes your way? You say, well, why, why is it necessary I mean, our faith is there when we need it. Why is it necessary that our faith be tested? Well, God doesn't test our faith for his benefit. God won't test your faith so that he can see how you'll respond. Remember, he's omniscient. He already knows how you're going to respond. Why does God test our faith? God tests our faith for our benefit. You see, when you're tested, your faith is going to stretch. Your, your faith is going to grow. When you're tested, God lets your faith be tested so that you can learn about yourself. When you're tested, pass or fail, you, you learn where you need to improve or, or you learn where you have grown in maturity and that strengthens your faith. Isaac's a young man by this time. Let's, let's say early adulthood is what we would say from, from our perspective. Abraham's already thinking ahead about the future, about the marriage of Isaac about the descendants that would come as, as the fulfillment of the promise that, that God has made. Abraham is thinking these thoughts, and verse 2 says, God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son as a burnt offering. Can you imagine the anguished questions in Abraham's heart and mind? God, you're, you're calling me to sacrifice my only son? How will Isaac, my only son, produce descendants if he's dead? And God, you're calling me to make a burnt offering of my son Isaac. That, that detestable practice is what the Canaanites do. There had to be a lot of questions in, the, in his heart and mind. But if you look at verse 3, there's apparently no hesitation. Verse 3 tells us he arose early, he got everything ready, and he set out on a three-day journey. 
God has instructed Abraham to take his son, his only son, Isaac, the son of promise, the son through whom Abraham's hopes and dreams will be fulfilled. And you say, wait a minute. It's not his only son. What about Ishmael? Ishmael was Abraham's son. Ishmael was the son of flesh, the son of compromise, the son of disobedience. Maybe one of the reasons God had Abraham send Ishmael away was to remind Abraham there could be no compromise. There could be no other way that the promise would be fulfilled. God's promise would be fulfilled by God himself, not by man. So literally, Abraham has no other son, and God is the ultimate test of his faith, is asking him to give up the son of his own age, his only son, his only hopeful fulfillment. God directs Abraham to the land of Moriah, to a mountain, a place of sacrifice that he is going to show him. By the way, if you've heard the name, the area of Moriah before, that is where Solomon built the temple and most of the Jewish people believe that the altar of burnt offerings in the temple was on the exact spot where Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac. Verse 3 tells us Abraham traveled three days. God sent him to a specific place to make the sacrifice. God doesn't explain why he's sending them to that specific spot. Ever heard of a place called Golgotha? You know where that is? Guess where it's located? Moriah. So they arrive at that spot, that place of sacrifice. Verse 5 says that Abraham tells the two young men who are with him, the boy and I will go over there to that spot. We'll go over there and worship. You know, this is the first mention of the word worship in the Bible. And that is significant. There, there's a rule of interpretation or understanding of Scripture, and it's called the rule of first mention. If you're trying to understand a particular word in the Bible, you should all, always go back to the first place that it's mentioned, because where it's mentioned, there's a, there's a key to understanding the use of the word elsewhere in the Bible. So this is the first place the word worship is mentioned. What do we need to understand about worship from Genesis 22, 5? We'll look at verse 5. Abraham is going to make a sacrifice. Now, for him, that sacrifice represents a total surrender of his hopes and his dreams, his most valuable treasure. He's going to make a sacrifice, and what he says is, we're going to go do what? Worship. You know, you've probably heard one of the most simple definitions of worship is, is to bow or to lay yourself prostrate. Picture Abraham laying down on the ground, face down, arms outstretched, hands open, just symbolic of the fact that he's letting go of himself and his future. He's laying all of his hopes and all of his dreams, all of his desires, all of his aspirations, he's laying them before the Lord and giving up everything in surrender. It's a picture of worship. I think Abraham's act of obedience, act of sacrifice is probably the greatest act of worship in the Bible. Because true worship puts everything on the altar before God. That's the picture of worship here in Genesis 22 and, and verse 5. Now, let's think for just a minute about our, our worship here in, in the worship center, in the venue. Let's think about our worship here corporately every Sunday. We would call John here in the worship center, Tyler in the venue, we would call them worship pastors, right? Right? And what do they do? Well, they do something that we're supposed to do. They, they lead us in offering praise to the Lord through song. Is that worship? That's only one phase of worship. It's a, it's a preparatory phase. What happens after we sing praises and songs to the Lord? Well, we come to this time, spending time in the Word. And I would submit to you that the time that we spend in the Word is a part of worship you could call me a worship pastor or any of our pastors who stand and, and speak and preach the word. You could call us worship pastors because that's also a preparatory phase of worship. The purpose of worship is not the music and the message. That's not worship in and of itself. The music 
and the message lead us to the place of worship. Worship is the sacrifice. It's, it's the complete giving of ourselves to the Lord. And, and that's why we always pause at the end of the message each week because we need to have time and opportunity after we've, we've sung songs of praise, after we've heard from the word, when we respond, then we have worshiped. Now, I'm not saying you can't worship during the, the song portion of the service. There, as you're singing, hopefully you're thinking about what you're singing and the commitments you're making as you sing those words, not to each other, but as you sing those words to the Lord, certainly as you're doing that, you can be worshiping. Certainly as you're hearing from the Word of God and hearing challenges from the Word of God and you're, and you're thinking, yes, Lord, I need to do that. I need to respond to that. I need to obey that. Certainly that's worship. When we respond in obedience, it's worship. What I'm saying to you this morning is please don't think just because you come in here on a Sunday and, and you sing and you hear the Word, please don't think you've worshiped. You worship when you respond in obedience. That's worship. That's the picture here in Genesis 22. When we worship, we're saying to the Lord, I I'm all yours. Anything standing in the way of my relationship, my walk with you, I, I surrender. In fact, I, I burn it up so it's gone and it is no more. That's worship. And I would submit to you that when we gather and, and we don't respond to the Lord, we haven't worshiped. We, we didn't quite get there if we don't respond to the Lord. True worship happens when we respond to the Lord. What, what did Paul say about worship? He said that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. That's our act of worship. And, and true worship happens daily, but when we gather here week by week corporately, it sure is good practice to make sure we're true worshipers, that daily we're sacrificing ourselves to the Lord. Verse 6 and 7 says that Abraham lays the wood on Isaac. That's on his shoulder, on his back. He, he burdens Isaac with the wood because Isaac is young and strong. Abraham carries the, the fire and the knife. And you have to be careful when you read this account. You don't think, well, Abraham knew God was not really going to make him sacrifice his son. No, Abraham did not know that. He was obeying exactly what God had told him to do. He didn't know what was going to happen next. He didn't know this was a test. He fully expected to obediently sacrifice his son, but his journey of faith had grown so much. Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham believed that even if God took Isaac's life through the sacrifice, that God was powerful enough to raise Isaac from the dead. I imagine on this three-day journey, there was probably very little conversation. I don't think Abraham would have been listed, interested in, in small talk. But as they're walking to the place of sacrifice, Isaac breaks the ice, the silence. He knew they were going to make a sacrifice. And Isaac, by this age, had probably many times helped his father prepare a sacrifice, prepare a, a burnt offering. And verse 7 he basically says, Dad, you, you have the torch and the knife. I have the wood. What about the animal? We, we didn't bring a lamb. Abraham's already in anguish. Can you imagine hearing your only son, whom God has called you to sacrifice, talk about the sacrifice out loud? That had to be crushing for him. But in the midst of the anguish is also a quiet confidence in the Lord. Look how he responds when Isaac asks, what about the sacrifice? He says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Literally, God will see to it. God will see to it. Listen, when you're walking with the Lord, when you're being obedient to him, you don't worry about this. You don't worry about this, the challenges. You don't worry about the difficulties. You just remind yourself, God will see to it. You know, the sacrifice of Isaac was not only the greatest uh, act of worship in Scripture, it's for certain the, the greatest demonstration of faith in the Old Testament. Abraham's promise, God's promise is completely wrapped up in Isaac. But if Isaac dies... And yet Abraham obeys God even though it doesn't make sense. Now you've heard me refer several times to the sacrifice of Isaac and you may be thinking, but 
I know the end of the story. He, he wasn't actually sacrificed. Oh, yes, he was. Abraham completely surrendered Isaac. All of his hopes, all of his dreams were wrapped up in the, the child of promise. He understood the child of promise did not belong to him. That child belonged to the Lord, and he completely let go and completely surrendered. And so they arrived at the place of sacrifice. It says that Abraham built the altar. He bound Isaac, and he laid him on the altar. Think about this. Isaac is probably about 18 to 20 years old at this time. That would put Abraham at about 120. Isaac's strong enough. We've already seen that he carried the wood up the mountain, he, so he's strong enough. We don't know that Abraham was physically capable of putting this 18 to 20-year-old strong young man on the altar. In verse 9, it says he lay him on the altar. The word lay just means to put in place. Abraham may not have been able to lift Isaac. We see that Isaac allowed himself to be bound. He probably climbed up on the altar, or at least helped Abraham get him up on the altar to place him there. Why do I mention that? Recognize this. At this point, Isaac knows the lamb being provided by God. Isaac recognizes that he's the sacrifice, but there's no struggle. Isaac is completely obedient and submissive. Why is that? I have no doubt that Isaac learned humble obedience from his father. Watching how his father lived for his God. Watching how his father consistently obeyed his Lord. And I also have no doubt that Isaac was raised up in such a way that he had a confident faith in God, the one who provides. And without a word, once Isaac is on that altar, without hesitation, we read that Abraham takes the knife and prepares to slaughter his son. I looked through multiple translations this week. About half of them use the word kill. About half of them use the word slaughter. And I thought about the word slaughter. That, that's a strong word, isn't it? I like it because it's brutal. Now, before you think your pastor is sick or somewhat crazy, I think it's good for us to realize we have to slaughter, we have to deal ruthlessly, we have to deal brutally with anything we might be tempted to put before the Lord. We can't toy with it. We, we can't play at it. To slaughter it. Anything that, that would get more of our love or more of our worship, anything that would come before the Lord, we have to slaughter Verse 11, the angel of the Lord comes and stops Abraham. Why? Because God sees his heart. God knows he's already sacrificed his son. He's obeyed God, withholding nothing. He's completely devoted. He's clearly full of faith. He knew God would keep his promise whether Isaac lived or died. Remember, Abraham told Isaac God would provide, God would see to it. And so he looks behind him, and there in the thicket is, is a ram. And what we see is God provided the sacrifice. God provided the ram for the sacrifice that God required. God required a sacrifice. God provided for the sacrifice. Think about us and our sin nature and the sacrifice God provided for our salvation. The Bible says God requires the shedding of blood to atone for sin. God requires the death of a, of a perfect sacrifice, but we couldn't provide that sacrifice for ourselves. And so God provided the sacrifice by sending his perfect, sinless son to be the sacrifice in our place. And so what we see here on Mount Moriah is in, in this scene is a foreshadowing of the sacrifice that's to come. It's a picture of what our Father was going to do in providing and seeing to it and providing the sacrifice for our sin. Think about some of the parallels here in Genesis 22 and in the coming of Christ. Isaac was the child of promise. He was the child through whom the promise would come. Jesus was the child through whom the promise would be fulfilled. 
both Isaac and Jesus were miraculously conceived. Now, Jesus' conception was also immaculate. It was without sin. There was, there was no man. He was not born of man, but born of the Holy Spirit. But it was a miraculous conception, as was Isaac's. Sarah wasn't capable of conceiving a child at the age of 90. Both Isaac and Jesus are identified as only sons. Both Isaac and Jesus were sacrificed by their fathers. Paul in Romans 8.32 said, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He made the decision to sacrifice his son. Both Isaac and Jesus are sacrificed on Moriah. Both of them carried the wood for their sacrifice. Both of them voluntarily submitted to their fathers. You remember Jesus in the garden? Not my will, but thine. And both fathers anticipated a resurrection. I already mentioned in Hebrews 11 that Abraham knew that if Isaac's life was indeed taken, that God could raise Isaac and keep his promise. And we know that Jesus was raised. And in him being raised in that resurrection power, he fulfilled the promise that all of us who are in Christ will also be raised to life. Verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place, Yahweh Raha, the Lord will provide. You've probably heard the transliteration of those Hebrew words. You've probably heard Jehovah Jireh, my provider. The name Abraham gave that place where the sacrifice was made spoke not only of God's provision for him, it also spoke of future God's provision for the needs of all the people. The Lord will provide. He will see to it. And then in verses 15 through 18, because of Abraham's obedience, you see the reaffirmation of the promise. By myself I have sworn, because you have done this, not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sand that's on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. You know, Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac points not only to God's sacrifice for us, but it points to our appropriate sacrifice to the Lord in response to his sacrifice for us. We are to worship. We are to completely let go, completely release all of our hopes, all of our dreams, all of our desires. We're not to have any treasure that we hold on to more tightly than a relationship with a God who loved us and provided for the sacrifice so that we can have a relationship with him both now and for all of eternity. Would you bow with me this morning? I believe it is vitally important that we take a moment to reflect on what the Lord has spoken specifically to us you know, the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells every believer means that he can speak to each of us at our point of need. And, and we're all at different points of need. We're all at different points in our spiritual journey. But he can take the word of truth and, and speak it at our point of need. And, and that calls for response. That's why we take this time at the end of each message. We spent time singing to the Lord entering his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. We spent time looking into his word, but we don't just look into his word to gain more information. We look into his word to know what he is calling us to. I think the very first thing you have to consider this morning is that if you don't know the Lord, if you don't have a relationship with him, if you have not come to the point of sacrifice, of making Christ Lord of life, then the sacrifice Jesus made doesn't help you. You receive forgiveness for sin. You receive the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross by admitting your sin, by asking for forgiveness, and by making Christ Lord of life. It's a sacrifice he calls you to. 
Many of you here in this room, many of you gathered in the venue, listening online, have, have made that decision. You've made Christ Lord of life, but if we're not careful, other things, treasures we hang on to can slip in and become more important to us. We can worship some of our treasures, and that worship can supersede our worship of the Lord. Nothing, nothing needs to come in the way of our relationship, of our walk with Christ. The life Jesus called us to is a life of sacrifice. So what, what is the Spirit saying to you this morning? What is he showing you this morning? What is he revealing about your own walk, your own life, your, your willingness to sacrifice anything that's in the way?
good truth, what a good challenge for our own hearts and lives this morning to sing as we close. What an incredible time in the Word this morning. Uh, We hope that you are encouraged. We hope that you heard the truth of the gospel, of the salvation that God provides to us. And we hope this morning uh, that we would be faithful as God's people to respond as we leave this room this morning, Uh, whether it be Sunday school as we go into our work week, school week, uh, that we would be faithful uh, to be obedient as God calls us. Um, and so thank you so much for uh, gathering with us. If you want to grab anyone at the Next step area, if you have any questions or want to talk with someone, we hope you'll do that as you leave. And uh, we hope you guys have a great rest of the, uh, your Sunday. We'll see you next week. Hi, this is Pastor Jason, and I just want to say thank you for joining us online for our services at Geyer Springs. We would love to know a little bit more about you and how we can serve you and your family. We desire to connect with you. So do us a favor, grab your phone and you can click the QR code that's on the screen right now, or you can go to gsfbc.org slash check in. And there you can tell us a little bit more about who you are and how we can serve you. Again, we love having you online. We hope we see you next week or join us in person for our worship services experience right here at Geyer Springs.